day, this morning, and the opportunity to be together in community, which is a time of joy, comfort, and sometimes challenges. The Unitarian Universalist Congregation is a place where we come to learn more about being human. We're not here because we figured out life's questions or because we think we've got it right. We come here to learn more about being in relationship to, with one another, how to listen, how to forgive, how to be vulnerable, and how to create trust and compassion in one another. Good morning, I'm Charlene Farley, and I'm a member of the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of the Emerald Coast. The opening words of the Reverend Eric Hewlett that I just quoted expresses one of the reasons that we come together as a religious community, to learn more about being human and recognizing what is required of one another as we journey on our spiritual paths. Unitarian Universalists welcome everyone, no matter their religion or lack thereof, race, color of their skin, age, or sexual orientation. Unitarian Universalists seek to understand the mysteries of life and what is more mysterious than contemplating on the afterlife. What do Unitarian Universalists believe about the afterlife? Well, our guest speaker this morning, the Reverend Beth Dana, Associate Minister at the UU Church of Austin will give us her perspective on this question. The sermon was first recorded or pre-recorded on September the 1st, 2019. After the service is con concluded, we hope that you'll join us in our Zoom coffee hour that follows at 11 a.m. The link is in the UUFEC news, e -news and in the order of service that you received. While you're getting ready for the Zoom event, take a minute to read the important announcements in the e-news. Now, let us move into worship, willing to be authentic with each other, honest within ourselves, and opening to connection in all its forms. The chalice as a symbol of Unitarian Universalism arose as a beacon of hope in an atmosphere of tyranny. The chalice arose as a sign of promise that the marginalized would neither be forgotten or ignored, 
because they are the beloved and precious from the perspective of the holy. This morning, we remember all of the people who have been told explicitly or implicitly through police violence or government policy, through derision or dehumanization, that they're anything less than whole, anything less than beloved. As we each light a chalice in our homes, may we make of our lives a beacon, a symbol of our promise to draw the circle wide, a sign that we will not rest until all means all. Hi, it's Amy again with another story for you. And this is a story from the Buddhist tradition. It's called a Jataka tale. And a lot of times um, people tell stories about animals, about how animals see humans or how animals try to act like humans to point out to us how exactly we're acting. So this story takes place in India. And I'm gonna share some pictures with you. These pictures were all taken um, either by me um, in Tanzania or by a friend of mine while she traveled around the world and took a lot of pictures of monkeys. So this story starts in the jungle in India. And uh, one day, some woodcutters who were cutting wood for the king in his palace came into the jungle and cut down a tree and there happened to be a little monkey in the tree. When the tree fell down, the monkey was stunned. And so they picked him up and carried him to the palace um, to help him get better. And he stayed in the palace and became a pet and did all kinds of funny things for the people in the palace. You know, he would run around and steal the king's crown and all kinds of crazy things. And they all loved him a lot. And then the king said, well, he's been such a good pet. Maybe we should reward him and let him go back and spend the rest of his days in the trees with his own friends and family. So he took him back into the jungle and put him in a tree. And there he is. And all his little friends came around and said, wow. Where have you been for so long? And what have you been doing? And he told them what had happened with the tree and that he had lived with the king and all the people. And they said, oh, tell us about the ways of people. Tell us about the grand deeds of the king. And the little monkey said, you don't really want to know about that. But they said, yes, we do. We want to know. So tell us. So he said, okay, so pick out one of you and you get up in the tree and all the rest of you bring him some fruit. He's the king. And so they kept bringing him fruit and made a huge pile of fruit all around the one who was pretending to be the king. And they said, and he said, so now I could never eat all this fruit and it leaves nothing for you. I couldn't eat this in a whole year. And the palace monkey, the one who had been living in the palace said, the point is that you're the king. You eat whatever you want, but you must not give any of it away. You must always keep a large pile so that others know you are very rich and very powerful. So the monkeys were wanting to be like men, so they kept bringing all the fruit to the king and just leaving it there and said, wow, what else do we do? And the one who had lived in the palace said, well, now you have to praise him in every way you can think of. And they said, okay, look at that beautiful coat. Look at how silky it is. And look at how he eats those green leaves so delicately. And isn't he a wonderful thing and so strong. And no wonder he's the king. And the 
Finally, the palace monkey said, well, enough of that. Now you have to go behind him and say terrible things about him. And they, first they didn't like this idea at all. They, it was kind of stupid. But the, the monkey who had lived in the palace said, if you want to learn how to be like people, you have to do this. So the monkeys got together and started whispering. Have you noticed how old he's getting? And his eyes seem dull and he's always forgetting what he said. And I think his fur is getting really ratty and thin looking. And if you notice that he eats more like a pig than a monkey. And at last, the king monkey, he was so insulted and he couldn't stand it anymore. So he chased them all away. And when he got back, all the fruit was gone. And he said, well, what happened? And the one who had lived in the palace said, well, thieves came and took all your fruit while you were gone. You need to send your guards out and catch them. That's what a king would do. And when the guards capture the thieves, they must be sentenced and put in prison for the rest of their life. And the monkey king said, what? That's what people do? And all the monkey said, no more, no more. We don't want to know anything else about the way of people and kings. And they all ran up in the trees and lived happily ever after. So thank you for listening to my story and I'll see you again. A poem by Billy Collins called The Afterlife. While you're preparing for sleep, brushing your teeth or riffing through a magazine in bed, the dead of the day are setting out on their journey. They are moving off in all imaginable directions, each according to his own private belief. And this is the secret that silent Lazarus would not reveal, that everyone is right as it turns out, you go to the place you always thought you would go, the place you kept lit in an alcove in your head. Some are being shot up a funnel of flashing colours into a zone of light, white as a January sun. Others are standing naked before a forbidding judge who sits with a golden ladder on one side, a coal chute on the other. Some have already joined the celestial choir and are singing as if they've been doing this forever while the less inventive find themselves stuck in a big air-conditioned room full of food and chorus girls. Some are approaching the apartment of the female god, a woman in her forties with short wiry hair and glasses hanging from her neck by a string, with one eye she regards the dead through a hole in her door. There are those who are squeezing into the bodies of animals, eagles and leopards, and one trying on the skin of a monkey like a tight suit, ready to begin another life in a more simple key, while others float off into some benign vagueness, little units of energy heading for the ultimate elsewhere. As a minister, I find myself talking with people quite often about death, which inevitably raises the question, what comes next? Is there an afterlife? And what do Unitarian Universalists believe about an afterlife? When planning this year's Seeker series focused on some of the most commonly asked questions in our church, this one definitely rose to the top. This theological question is also personal. We know the pain of loss. We fear that when we die, we will be annihilated and our unique consciousness will be gone. We worry that our life here and now is purposeless. We fear the loss of our relationship with those we love, and we fear we will be forgotten. David Eagleman speaks to this kind of fear in some Tales from the Afterlives, a book that he wrote of 40 imagined possibilities of life beyond death. One of these tales describes three deaths that each person goes through. 
The first is when the body ceases to function. The second is when the body is put in the grave. The third is that moment, sometime in the future, when our name is spoken for the last time. Eagleman imagines a lobby in which everyone awaits their third death. Some wait a very long time. Historical figures, for example, who wait, as he says, with aching hearts for their statues to fall. Others may leave the lobby sooner than they had hoped. The reading we heard earlier from Rachel Naomi Remen brings up something that is more common than I myself realized until I began my ministry, and that is experiences around death that we cannot explain. Where did the voice of Tim's father come from when he hadn't spoken in at least 10 years? As a hospital chaplain, I sat with people who, as they neared death, began seeing and hearing people who I couldn't see, including loved ones who had died long ago. They weren't scared. Rather, they were filled with joy and hope at being in the presence of those whom they had lost. It's as if in their final moments they had mastered the art of losing that the poet Elizabeth Bishop writes about in her poem, One Art. She says, the art of losing isn't hard to master. So many things seem filled with the intent to be lost that their loss is no disaster. She goes on to describe many losses, door keys, an hour badly spent, memories of places and names, her mother's watch, and people she loved. Bishop's father died when she was a baby and her mother suffered a nervous breakdown and she went to live with family and never saw her again. In adulthood, Bishop lost her partner to suicide. She learned over time the art of losing. Loss that looks like a disaster, but which was intended when life began. I met a young girl once, also when I was doing hospital chaplaincy, who was struggling with this art of losing. She was visiting her grandmother in the hospital who was there with end-stage cancer. I could tell that the granddaughter was grappling with the idea of her grandmother being gone, or no longer being there with her, that this loving and caring presence in her life would be gone. The grandmother told her, when I die, I won't be gone. I'll be flying with the birds. So whenever you see a bird, you'll know that I'm near. And the girl thought about this for a bit, and as it sunk in, I could see her demeanor change. She seemed more calm and clearly comforted by her grandmother's assurance. I hope that this young girl, now not so young, still feels her grandmother's presence in her life. And a few years ago, I was sitting in my office with the parents of a 44-year-old man who had died very suddenly. We were talking about his life and planning for his memorial service when a bright red bird landed on the windowsill and rested there, kind of watching us. The father stopped and said, look. He explained that the red bird was his son, Robert. I could see tears well up in his eyes and we all stopped and looked. I thought, what a beautiful bird. Yeah, he is watching us. I could feel both the weight of the loss and the power of this father's love for his son in that moment. And he was comforted by the sense that Robert was still with him and that even though he died so young, that his love was still present in his parents' lives. Now, I know that many of you have had experiences like these because when they happen or when the topic comes up at church like today, you tell your ministers, in, often in hushed tones, about them. You whisper to us, wondering, is this okay here? Will I be laughed at? So let me say here from the pulpit, in very clear terms, that it is okay to share these experiences here. And it's okay to believe that they are very real. Too often, Unitarian Universalists get painted as strictly rational people who dismiss experiences that we cannot prove or explain. But we are also a people who freely ask questions and search for truth and meaning. At times like these, when we witness the connection between the living and those who have died, we can trust our experiences and glean insight and meaning from them. We are a church that 
welcomes your questions, and wrestles with them in very honest ways. And what better place is there than church to explore such important, deep, and meaningful experiences and the insights about life and death that arise from them? When, I asked what Unit when asked what Unitarian Universalists believe about the afterlife, the beginning of my answer is fairly simple. We catch glimpses of an afterlife in this life, in our experiences of love. But we haven't been to the afterlife yet, and so we probably don't know the fullness of what it is. The Sufi poet Rumi wrote in Inner Sunrise, go within, hear the story of the sunrise from the sun itself. If there were no sunrise within, I would have set long ago. Of course, we know that the sun rises even after it sets. The inner sunrise is eternal, as is the love of this life that we are living now. Without this kind of love, we would have set long ago. The love of our lives survives death and brings us into ever greater harmony with the divine. The affirmation that we grow in harmony with the divine forever, that we say every Sunday, has roots in our universalist tradition and the belief that God would never infinitely punish us finite humans by sending us to hell. There are variations on this theology, but what they share is a trust in the goodness of an all-loving God whose love is eternal. Unitarian Universalist beliefs about the afterlife are also informed by science. We say we come from dust and to dust we shall return, and not just because the Bible says it, but because that's physically what happens to us. <laughs> We're part of something larger that still exists on a certain level when we die. The atoms that made us came from other forms of life before us. As we sometimes say, we are made of stardust. And when we die, these atoms return to the universe and become other forms of life. This is the common destiny that we share with all of life. While individual people and lives come to an end, they are never entirely lost. <clears throat> Unitarian Universalists in this church and elsewhere have shared with me a number of beliefs and hopes about an afterlife. Of course, some believe that at death, nothing happens. Some have a sense that they'll be reunited with their loved ones who have died when they themselves die, and that possibility brings us comfort as we near the end of life. Some believe in reincarnation, that our soul is reborn in a new body. Some believe that the matter of our bodies becomes part of the universe of matter, taking other shapes and forms over time. Some believe that the energy or spirit of a person who dies is reabsorbed or expressed through their children or grandchildren or nieces or nephews. Some believe that the spirits of those who have died continue to move among us living. And then there are, of course, some who don't give it much thought at all, and that's okay too. We will not find a capital T truth about death and the afterlife in Unitarian Universalism, but we can find a love that sustained, sustains us in this sanctuary, in our lives, and beyond this life, because love never dies. Love transforms and connects us as we enter this life, as we make our way through it, and as we leave it. Rachel Naomi Remen's story concludes, much of life can never be explained, but only witnessed. As Unitarian Universalists, we have many beliefs about the afterlife. And we affirm the importance of finding meaning and purpose, not only in the hope of something coming after death, but in this life that we are living now. We must bear witness to the goodness and the value of this life. Whatever comes after death, this life matters very much. As the poet Jean Lomans asks, did I love? Finish my task in the world. Learn at least one of the many names of God. At the intersections, the boundaries where one life began and another ended. The jumping off places between fear and possibility. At the ragged edges of pain, did I catch the smallest glimpse of the holy? This is what we do here. We love and are loved. We discern our gifts and purpose. We do good work in the world. 
We move from fear to possibility, and we catch glimpses of the holy here and there. If we do these things before we die, we will have caught glimpses of the goodness and holiness of whatever comes after death. So trust your experiences. Trust those glimpses. Bear witness to them and find hope in them for you and for all whom you love. May it be so. Amen. As we go forward into this frightening, exhilarating, confusing, miraculous world, may we offer our comfort to the afflicted, our love to those who are lonely, and our wish for all to be safe.